guys, I'm so excited to be here with you today because today is truly about all of us, us younger people. Furthermore, it's about all of our ideas and how together they can form even greater ideas. That's what's really cool about this event. It highlights the fact that we are truly unlimited and we're never too young to make a difference when we follow our passions. For me, my passion lies at the intersection of computer science and biomedical research. Particularly, I became interested in computer science when I was in seventh grade. I was taking this elective course on futuristic thinking, and I came across the concept of artificial intelligence. I was enthralled. I went home, I bought a coding book, and I decided that that was what I was going to focus on. However, when I was in 10th grade, my cousin was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I saw firsthand the experience and the impact this has on a woman and her family. It was then that I knew that I wanted to get involved and make a difference. The way I chose to do this was by combining my passion for artificial intelligence with my newfound passion for breast cancer diagnostics. So you may be wondering, why do I find science so fascinating? Well, I think science is truly our chance to revolutionize the world. Through science, you can ask questions, pose questions that have never been asked before, and come up with your own experiments to find answers. And it's an infinite process, so the more answers you get, the more questions you develop. So for me, I first got really interested in artificial intelligence because it's the fact that these programs can literally transcend human knowledge. The way they work is people try to model the brain's neurons and their interconnections so that these programs can detect patterns that are far too complex for even the programmer to recognize. I found out that one in eight women diagnosed breast cancer, so it wasn't like my cousin was alone in this battle, and that was a huge impetus for me to really get involved in the research. Early detection is instrumental to treatment success, and that's when I knew I really wanted to work on the detection process. So I just decided to focus in on the fine needle aspirate. FNAs are the least invasive, the quickest, and the cheapest form of biopsy a woman can have. However, they're wildly inconclusive, so a lot of doctors refuse to use them. And if they could be used, they're the most accessible to the general public, so it would really help improve the process. I thought that by applying the concepts of artificial intelligence and this other concept of cloud computing, which I'll go into a bit later, I could provide a tool for doctors to use when analyzing these FNAs to make them more conclusive and hopefully revive them back into hospitals. So this is what an FNA actually looks like. Essentially, the way the process works is a doctor takes a fine needle and extracts a few cells. These cells are then looked at and stained under a microscope. They're then stained to be looked at under a microscope, excuse me. And so the doctor would then try to make a call. However, that's really difficult because the cells can exhibit both cancerous and non-cancerous attributes. So if you look at this far mass, that's a benign mass. And you may have guessed that because the cells are about the same size and about the same shape. However, the nucleoli, the little dots in the cells, are very prominent, and there are multiple ones per cell. That's not normal, and that's actually an indicator that this mass would be cancer, even though it is, in fact, benign. The bottom mass is also a benign mass, despite the fact that the edges are multilayered, which is a cancerous attribute. And then the top mass is cancer. However, the really light cells are actually devoid of their cytoplasm, and that's an indicator that the mass would be benign, even though it's not. Again, the purpose of these pictures is just to reiterate the fact that we really need a tool to help pathologists who are in the lab looking at these. So the way I decided to di design that tool was by feeding in nine morphological attributes that related to how the cells looked. These logical inputs were then converted into their binary representation. Now, binary is a system of ones and zeros, so they're a lot, they make the program a lot more brain-like because the brain's neurons are either firing or not. This artificial input layer then makes 216 connections with the hidden layer. And what these connections really are is their math. A similar process occurs between the hidden layer and the output layer until the program arrives at a diagnosis. It's really important to remember this is a backpropagation neural network meaning it's going to learn based on its experiences and mistakes. As it iterates through in training mode, it's going to strengthen synapses that are helpful in getting the correct diagnosis and make ones that are harmful smaller. The other thing that's really cool about applying neural networks to cancer diagnostics is the fact that neural networks are constantly learning and evolving. 
So as cancer mutates, my program can handle that. So you may be wondering why my program is working so well, and there are four principal reasons for that. One of them is the fact that I'm working with raw, unformatted data. There's no doctor going in and telling the program what to look at. I'm letting the computer use its own mind. In addition, I have this artificial input layer, and then I also have heavy malignant weighting, so anything that is remotely borderline will be called cancer because those patients are imperative to diagnose correctly. And then my inconclusive logic is really kind of cool. Instead of being based on the sigmoid function, which is that S-shaped curve over there, I actually simultaneously create 10 neural networks, and then they vote. And if they don't all agree, then that's how mass is deemed inconclusive. And since they're all learning, they learn a bit differently. After the program was working, I deployed it to the cloud, because the cloud is just this incredible elastic entity that can scale to support usage by every hospital in the world. And I have it working as a web service. You can go online to cloudforcancer.appspot.com and check it out. So moving forward, I was really excited by the results I saw. I was able to diagnose over 99% of cancer patients correctly. And I ran a series of 7.6 million trials, proving that as I got more data, the success rate should only increase while the inconclusive rates would decrease. And this is where the theme of unlimited kind of came back to me. Because at that point, I took this invention to the Google Science Fair and ended up winning the grand prize. And this gave me this incredible platform where I was able to share my research. So at the age of 17, I found myself talking with hospitals. And I was actually able to beta test my program in two hospitals and prove that it can work with multiple institutions. And I know that as I move forward, I'll be able to roll it out to even more people. However, this is science. So when this was working, I started having more questions. Specifically, I wanted to know if the same sort of tactics could be extended to work with many, if not all, types of cancer. I chose to focus on leukemia for two principal reasons. One, leukemia is very different from breast cancer. It's a cancer of the blood. And the data I found for leukemia, there were 12,582 attributes, which was completely different from the public domain data for breast cancer that only had nine. However, I think the more important reason for me was the fact that I researched this subset of leukemia called MLL leukemia. It's a particularly aggressive form of disease with a very poor prognosis. Furthermore, it's really sad because the highest incidence rates come from the infant population and from people with secondary cancers. I also found out that currently those patients are treated the same way somebody with ALL or AML would be treated, which are other subsets of cancer. So there's really no targeted treatment. And that's why I really wanted to focus in on diagnosing MLL. So I decided to do that based on genetic expression profiles. Essentially, if you look at the diagram behind me, all of those dots actually represent numbers. And these numbers are representative of what messenger RNA is present in the cell. Messenger RNA is a really cool thing to look at because it's what codes for the proteins. So in looking at that, you're able to see which proteins would be present in a cell. And those proteins are actually what cause the cell's behavior. So you can see that these don't look that different upon first glance. But I fed all of the numbers into my program, which resulted in over 200,000 artificial input nodes. And my program did get some success. In training mode, it was about 97% successful. But it was very sluggish. It would have taken me over a year to run all the trials I wanted to run. And it had a lot of background noise that was confusing the program. So I decided to create a hybrid neural network. And I did that by doing statistical pre-processing. So I built a program that would look through and it would find all of the gene expression values where the MLL protein value was at least two standard deviations away from both the ALL and the AML mean. And in doing that, I was able to create this new model that's working really well. In fact, I was able to diagnose 100% of the samples correctly. And even if I hadn't used inconclusive logic, which I think is very valid because doctors need to know what they don't know, I would have still diagnosed over 99% of the patients correctly. However, I think the results I'm most excited by is the fact that I found a trend. There were four particular proteins that were consistently most important in the network's decision to call something MLL or not. Now, I think those proteins could be what's causing these MLL cases to be so aggressive. Obviously, there are wet lab experiments that need to be run. But these may be potential drug targets, because the difference with MLL and other types of cancer 
is this one MLL gene translocates onto a different chromosome, which causes a slew of fusion proteins to be created. So if we can target those, we might be able to improve the prognosis for these patients. So you may be wondering, what's next for me? Well, I'm continuing my research on breast cancer and on leukemia, and I'm hoping to get it into more hospitals soon. I recently submitted an article for peer review, so I'm really excited, and hopefully that will be published in a journal. I'll find out in December whether I got accepted or not. I'm also a freshman at Duke University, and I absolutely love it there. Again, this was another opportunity that I got that, where people really put their trust in me and gave me the opportunity to be unlimited. I received a full merit scholarship, and I've been able to dual major in both biology and computer science. I'm also taking this genome science course, where 18 freshmen, freshmen, let me tell you, are given the opportunity to sit in a seminar with a guy who just got elected to the National Academy of Sciences and who helped sequence the X chromosome. His class has been really inspiring, and I'm looking forward to pursuing a genome certificate as well. I also recently was able to join an ovarian cancer epigenetic lab, and that's been really exciting because I'm finally getting some wet lab back background and some wet lab techniques. However, I'm particularly interested in this data set that the lab has for DNA methylation, and I want to see if these methylation epigenetic changes can be correlated to predict which cases of ovarian cancer will relapse, and I'm hoping to use my program to analyze that. So I'd like to wrap this up and leave you with a few thoughts. Albert Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And I think that, in particular, applies to all of us. We're young. We don't know what conventionally we can't do. We go out and we try things, and a lot of times they work. We're at the height of our creativity. So it's really important that we get involved and we follow our passions, whatever they may be. Because I do recognize that everybody in this audience isn't necessarily as interested in science as I am. But I know you're all passionate about something. And I can't express enough how many people are willing to help you fulfill that passion. So we're the people who are going to be living in the future, so I'd like to put out a challenge. It's up to us to define what that future looks like, so why not start now? Thank you so much.